Lord, we do praise you for your word. We thank you that you have given it to us for our instruction, for our learning, for our edification. Uh, we pray that we pay attention this morning. And uh, I know long lists of names tend to be things we often skip over or breeze through in our reading. So we thank you for the opportunity to slow down and take a deeper look at how you have sovereignly organized the whole world. Uh, we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you all may be seated. Just wait till we get to the book of Numbers. That was awesome. Thank you. All right, let's start with our main point. God is sovereign over all the nations of the earth. He divided them, arranged them, preserved them, and destroyed them to the end that he would rule over them. So we continue asking the question, who can save us? All these nations spreading out from Babel are looking for a God and losing the God they once had. They're forgetting him. They're turning away from him. God is going to call out a peculiar people for this reason, and we are fast approaching in the text where he does that. But we deal first with the last two sons of Ham. We'll look at the origins of Egypt, the origins of the promised land, and then how these nations were spread abroad. So we start then with the sons of Egypt. Now you might say that in that list, you didn't see Egypt anywhere. If you were reading the Hebrew Bible, you would see Egypt because the name for Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. So Mitzrayim, that first great world power after Babel fell, was Egypt. You see Mitzrayim's name down here in the red. Mitzrayim is not a plural like the I-M usually is. It's a dual. In Hebrew, they have not just singular or plural, but they have singular, dual, and plural. So this isn't speaking of all the people of Egypt, but this is speaking of the land of Egypt. We can see when Egypt and Egyptians are put side by side, we get Mitzrayim, the dual, and Mitzrim, the plural. Mitzrayim probably refers to lower and upper Egypt. Egypt itself was a land divided into two pieces. Now, lower Egypt, uh, confusingly enough, is the northern half of Egypt, and upper Egypt is the lower half because the river flowed south. So downstream was lower Egypt and upstream was upper Egypt. Now, when we think of ancient civilizations, we usually think of Egypt probably first. This one might come to mind because so many of its building projects are still visible today. Here's Abu Simbel in Aswan, Upper Egypt. That is the southern part of Egypt. A great temple there, the Great Pyramids of Giza in Giza, Lower Egypt. These were all spreading out from Babel, taking with them the knowledge they had at Babel and bringing it to their new lands. We've seen from Japheth and the other sons of Ham that they went pretty far, but these ones didn't go very far. Just a couple hundred miles from Babel, not even a thousand miles. Egypt is also called the land of Ham occasionally in the Psalms. Egypt or Mitzrayim was one of the earliest great sons of Ham. He had the first great dynasty after Nimrod. And so of the direct descendants of Ham in the first generation, he was the greatest. This nation rose to become a superpower. And so Egypt was designated the land of Ham here in Psalm 105. Now we get seven different sons listed from Mitzrayim. This is possibly not all the sons that he had, but he also had daughters, so we know this is not all the children that he had. But you'll notice something when you go through these names is wherein other grandchildren of uh, Ham, you might recognize some of the names, you don't recognize these names, and we'll 
talk about why that is. I, mean, I don't know, maybe you don't recognize any of the names of any of these, but these aren't names we see very often in the rest of Scripture. These ones don't come up that often, but Moses knew them, and we'll see why Moses knew them. We start with the oldest son, Ludim. Ludim, after getting to Egypt, headed west. Similar to Put, his uncle, he headed out towards Tunisia and Tripolis. Anamim, his brother, didn't go quite as far. He went to ancient Cyrene, which is modern-day Benghazi. You might remember Simon the Cyrene who helped carry Jesus' cross. He would have been from this area. Now, uh, once again, as we will see later, he probably didn't descend from Anamim, but he did come from the land of Cyrene where Anamim first settled. Lehavim, from which we probably get the name Libya. His ancient name was Libibas. He went down a little south of Cyrene into, uh, well, Libya. Naphtahim stayed pretty close in Lower Egypt, populating much of the southern Delta region, and founded the capital of Memphis. Pathrusim left his name on the great city uh, Pathros in Upper Egypt, and this was the southern dynasty in Egypt. Often there were two dynasties ruling at once, the southern and the northern dynasties. And here Pathros is mentioned at times as what's called a synecdoche, which is referring to a part as the whole. So Pathros is sometimes used to refer to Egypt as a whole. In Jeremiah 44, it says the word came to Jeremiah for all the Jews living in the land of Egypt, those who were living in Migdol, Tophanes, Memphis, and the land of Pathros. And then later, after he ridicules all of these Jews living in the land of Egypt whose wives were going after idols, all the men who were aware that their wives were burning sacrifices to other gods, along with all the women who were standing by as a large assembly, including all the people who were living in Pathros in the land of Egypt, responded to Jeremiah, and essentially they told him, get lost. These lands were godless lands, though you can't quite say that. They had plenty of gods, but they had lost the one true God. By the time Israel is dwelling in the land of Egypt, they had forgotten the God who sent them away from Babel. This is where things tend to get a little sticky, because here is a name that we do recognize, Philistines. They were perennial enemies of Israel when they entered into the promised land. The Philistines just wouldn't seem to go away. But here it tells us that the Philistines came from Kasluhim. These were its descendants, or they migrated from Kasluhim, which was probably up there on the eastern side of the delta, uh, northern part of the Sinai Peninsula up into Gaza. But things get sticky because Amos 9.7 tells us are you not the sons of Ethiopia to me, or sons of Israel, declares the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor? Not Kastlehim. What's Amos talking about? The Philistines from Kaphtor and the Aramaeans from Ker. So which brother was it? Kastlehim or Kaphtor, who gave rise to the Philistines? Well, Moses tells us that they are descendants of Kasluhim, and Amos tells us that they, let me get the verse, that the Philistines came from Kaphtor. Kaphtor is on the island of Crete. This is the only island nation known from these sons of, Is or from these sons of Egypt, and Crete after the time of Moses, invaded Gaza. They deposed 
much of Kasluhim and took over the land. And so what was once Kasluhim became the Kaftarim. Moses knew this. Moses knew a lot of things that seemed to trip us up, but for him, that was the global economy of his day. He knew it well. Deuteronomy 2.23, Moses explains the Avim, which was the Philistine tribe down there in the Kasluhim area, who lived in the villages as far up as Gaza, and the Kaftarim, who came from Kaftor, destroyed them and lived in their place. So what happened? The Kasluhim were the first ones to migrate into Gaza. The Kaftarim migrated over to Crete and then later came and destroyed those who were at Kasluhim. And so the Philistine name was given to Kaftarim later. So the Philistines that Israel is interacting with are Kaftarim. Now there's a lot we don't know about Moses' life. We get a few events here and there, but he lived 120 years. We may have some solid history from Josephus. We can't be certain about it because it is not God's inspired word. But he explains something called the Ethiopic Wars. This is a war between Egypt and Ethiopia during Moses' lifetime. And it probably explains why none of these tribes became popular tribes later on in biblical history. Why didn't Israel ever have to deal with these tribes? Because they no longer existed. They were destroyed in the Ethiopic Wars. But Moses, who lived in Egypt at that time and had just recently seen them overthrown, still knew them as superpowers. Josephus, writing about these Ethiopic Wars, says, now all the children of Mesraim possessed the country from Gaza to Egypt, though it retained the name of only one, the Philistine. As for the rest, we know nothing of them besides their names for the Ethiopic War, which we shall describe hereafter was the cause that those cities were overthrown. Now Moses was a pretty interesting guy, wasn't he? He was raised by the Egyptians, he was taught in the Egyptian schools, and yet he was a Hebrew, and God used him to rescue the Hebrew people from the oppression in Egypt. And Stephen, the first church martyr, when reciting a sermon that God gave him the words for, refers back to Moses and talks about this education. He says, after he had been set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. She, he was raised in the royal household of the Pharaoh. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. You'll notice when we get to it in Exodus and Leviticus, he wasn't giving us Egyptian learning. He was giving us learning from God, even though the, that was his schooling. That was not the wisdom that he looked to when writing the law. He looked to God for wisdom, but he was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. He was a man of power, both in words and in deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And from that point forward, the history of Moses is recorded in our Bibles. Josephus seems to believe that there was a lot going on in Moses' life before he turned 40. He was a part of the royal household, and the royal household uh, at one time called on him to be a general in the Ethiopic Wars. The Ethiopians, who are next neighbors to the Egyptians, made an inroad into their country, which they seized upon and carried off the effects of the Egyptians, who, in their rage, fought against them, and revenged the affronts they had received from them, but being overcome in battle, some of them were slain, and the rest went, ran away in a shameful manner, and by that means saved themselves. When the Ethiopians began to invade Egypt, the Egyptians ran away. Whereupon the Ethiopians followed after them in the pursuit, and thinking that it would be a mark of cowardice if they did not subdue, to, uh, subdue all of Egypt, they went on to subdue the rest with greater vehemence. And so those great nations and tribes that came from Mitzrayim 
were falling one by one in the days of Moses. And when they had tasted the sweets of the country, they never left off the uh, prosecution of the war. And as the nearest parts had not courage enough at first to fight with them, they proceeded as far as Memphis and the sea itself, all the way into the heart of Egypt, while not one of the cities was able to oppose them. Ethiopia, remember, were the sons of Cush. So Cush, the brother of Mitzrayim, was taking over Mitzrayim's territory. Now remember, Put went to the west, Cush went to the south, and Mitzrayim wedged himself in the northeast corner. It was just a matter of time before he'd be pushed out by territorial expansion. And so that's what's happening. But then finally, the Egyptians, under this sad oppression, betook themselves to their oracles and prophecies. And when God had given them this counsel to make use of Moses the Hebrew and take his assistance, the king commanded his daughter to produce him that he might be the general over their army. Long story short, Moses saved the day. Now, this may or may not be true history. Josephus records it as history. Eusebius also records it as history, and so does Herodotus. Now, they might all be looking at the same sources, but it is very possible here that Moses had a military career before ever he was called by God to lead the sons of Israel out of Egypt. But how much better was his career for God than his career for Egypt? All the lands that he conquered, perhaps, or the men that he kept from conquering more of Egypt. Yet in his career for God, he brought the destruction of Egypt. Ten great plagues brought down on Pharaoh, brought down the entire economy of Egypt, and then Pharaoh himself drowns in the Red Sea, chasing after Moses and the sons of Israel. And so, once again, it's no wonder why not only none of these sons of Mitzrayim became great powers again, but even Egypt, for the first few hundred years of Israel's growth in the Promised Land, didn't rise again as a superpower. Because although Moses may have risen to their rescue at one time, God chose to use him to bring Egypt down. Now we come to the sons of Canaan. Canaan is the last listed son here of Ham. We got four Hamite sons, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. And remember, Canaan was the youngest. He was the fourth, specifically cursed, by, Mos or by uh, Noah. This came after Ham and his sin against Noah. Noah cursed his youngest son in his youngest son. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son, Ham, had done to him. And so he said, Cursed be Canaan, Ham's youngest son. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. Now this curse does extend to all of the sons of Ham. We see that practically. Once again, we have a synecdoche. Noah is making a point that his youngest son has disappointed him. His youngest son has sinned against him. And so Ham's youngest son, Canaan, will become like sin to him. But Canaan does really get the brunt of the curse. It does fall primarily on him. And he is the one whose land is taken away and given to the peculiar people of God. This was the land that God called Abraham into. Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the oaks of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. It was Canaan's land, specifically, that would be given over to the sons of Israel. And Moses knew this when he was writing the curse of Canaan. He was identifying 
for Israel, their right to the land from God's own mouth. Now these people were not deserving of their land. The land had spewed them out. God gave them enough time to repent and they didn't. And so in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, when God is explaining through Moses to the sons of Israel why the Canaanites are being kicked out of their land and how to preserve themselves from falling into the same traps, he says, do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all the... For by all these, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it, so the land has spewed out its inhabitants. The Canaanites continued in the same sins as Ham. Just like we saw Nimrod took after his grandpa, so did Canaan take after his dad. These sins continued to redouble themselves. And so by the time we get to the Exodus, the people in Canaan had become so depraved that they that the land itself was spitting them out. And God would replace them with Israel. So let's take a quick look here at the city states of Canaan. Canaan has eleven named sons. Once again, there may be other sons. There certainly are other daughters. Only the 11 are named. These likely have to do with the language groups that came out of Babel. So first, we have Sidon, his firstborn, the oldest of Canaan. Sidon is still a city today. In the scripture, we often think of it with its sister city, Tyre. Tyre and Sidon. Many times Jesus will tell the unbelieving Jews that if these miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, these Gentile territories, these godless territories, they would have received these miracles and believed. Sidon is often referred to as a city opposed to God. Tyre and Sidon both, especially in the book of Ezekiel, come under particular ridicule from God for their activities against Israel. Sidon, like most of these Canaanite tribes, will become the enemies of Israel. Sidon is in the middle of Phoenicia, modern-day Lebanon, between Tripoli in the north, or Beirut in the north central, and Tyre in the south. This would become the homeland of the Phoenicians. We also do see this uh, in Elijah's day, when he is leaving Israel because of a famine and a drought, he goes up to Syrophoenicia in Sidon, and he meets a Syrophoenician woman whom, or whose daughter, or whose son, rather, uh, he heals. All right, the next son is Heth. Now, both Sidon and Heth are probably the names of the actual patriarch, whereas the rest, as you'll see, are probably the peoples that came from them. Sidon and Heth were well known back then. Heth today is not as well attested. In fact, up until the early 1800s, biblical scholars didn't believe that it had ever existed. They thought it was just an allegorical city that had been made up uh, for the sake of having some enemy for Israel. These were the Hittites. Then in 1834, a Hittite city was discovered. And once again, modern science was catching up with what the Bible already knew. Here is Hattusa and Bogaskale, uh, Asia Minor, on the eastern side of Turkey. A Hittite colony was discovered. It's in ruins today. It was probably abandoned sometime in Israel's judges or early Davidic dynasty. Second Chronicles 8-7 tells us, All the people who were left of the Hittites 
the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites who were not of Israel, namely their descendants who were left after them in the land when the sons of Israel had not destroyed them, Solomon raised as forced laborers to this day. Remember that curse of Canaan. All of those who were left in the land who were Canaanites were subjected to Solomon's kingdom. They became forced labor. But notice when it says that all of those who were left in the land, some of them were not left in the land, some of them did migrate away, especially as Israel became a superpower in the region. In fact, Heth, who first went up to Asia Minor, eastern Turkey, probably sometime in the first hundred years or first few hundred years of Israel's growth, headed out across Persia, across Uzbekistan, into the land of China, and became what today is known as the Cathay. This is a poetic name for China. It especially planted itself in Hong Kong. Now, these may not be the direct descendants, but this name is traceable across this path. These Heth become the Keth, become the Cathay. And then they settle in eastern China all the way over to southwestern Hong Kong. The Jebusites are a people group. They probably come from the patriarch Jebus. He's mentioned in Judges 120. The sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now this is Judges before David came and finally pushed the Jebusites out of Jerusalem because that was where God had planned to put his temple. In 1 Chronicles 11.4, we see this happen. David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is Jebus, and the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were there. The inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. These Jebusites dwelled in the land that God had planned to give to David, to give to Solomon, to build his temple. And this is where his millennial temple will sit as well. This is where God plans to localize his presence on earth. This is the very throne from which Jesus will rule over the earth when he returns. This is an important tract of land. Second Chronicles 3 says, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place, of, at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. This was the plot of land that the temple was built on. So the Jebusites were in Jerusalem. Now the Amorites, we know this name from pretty much everywhere in the Old Testament. It pops up again and again and again. The Amorites is another synecdoche where the one sometimes refers to the whole. And this, in this case, in Genesis 15, probably has to do with the fact that these were the neighbors of Abraham. When he came into the land of Canaan, he was dwelling in an Amorite town. His friends were Amorite brothers. His allies were Amorite brothers. And so when God in Genesis 15 makes a covenant with Abraham and tells him that the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete, and so he can't give him the land yet, but he will take him into Egypt for 400 years and then bring him back once the Amorites have become bad enough. Sometimes we might miss the fact that the Amorites are Abraham's friends. God is telling him, your friends have not yet digressed to the point where the land itself will spew them out. So when he leaves for Egypt, his friends there in the land become enemies. So that in Genesis 15, 18 through 21, when God lists out the land that Abraham will receive. He gives him the land of the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Cadmonite, which we'll study in a few months, and the Hittite, 
the Perizzite, the Rephaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusites. About half of these names we recognize from the list of Canaan's sons. Genesis 13 and 14, they're sometimes skipped. They're not, not as well studied as the other books. This records a big war between the new king that rose up in Shinar, which is possibly Hammurabi, and the kingdom of Sodom, where Abraham's nephew Lot had been kept. During this war, it says, a fugitive came and told Abraham the Hebrew that his nephew Lot had been captured. So now he, Abram, was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Aner, and those were the allies with Abraham. These Amorites were his friends. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out the trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And we see in Genesis 14, 24, that these Amorite allies, these brothers, helped him retrieve Lot. And when he's offered a reward, he says, I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamer. Let them take their share. These Amorites were his friends, they were his allies, and when God came to him just in the next verses and said, the Amorites' sins have not yet grown to the point where I will kick them out of the land, God was telling him, your friends, your friends' land will become yours. And so this was the area of the Dead Sea. The Girgashites, these aren't mentioned elsewhere in scripture, or at least not as the Girgashites. Their name probably became the Gergesenes, the Gadarenes, and the Gerizenes. These are on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus himself went there at one point, actually two points, but once with his disciples to show them a man who had been demonized, by legions of demons in order to show them what a man operating by the power of demons truly looked like because the Pharisees were accusing Jesus of being demon possessed and operating by the power of demons. This probably happened in the land of the Girgashites on the eastern side of Galilee. Here's a picture for you up there in those hills. The Hivites, these are elsewhere called the Horites. They lived in the area of Ephraim in the northern part of Israel. And one very famous Hivite was named Shechem. He was the son of Hammer, the Hivite. And he is the one who raped one of of uh, Jacob's daughters, Dinah. And then two of Dinah's brothers, Levi and Simeon, went out and took matters into their own hand, massacred the whole city of Shechem. These uh, friends of Abraham are already turning into enemies, but not because they are waxing worse and worse, but because Jacob's children are not listening to God. God's going to do double duty when he brings them out of, out of the land of Canaan and into Egypt. He's going to protect them from their neighbors who they've uh, treated poorly here by not following God, but following their own flesh. But he's also going to grow them into a strong nation down there because the Egyptians will not associate with the Hebrews. The Archites don't have much to do with Noah's Ark, except that they came off the Ark through Noah. They are from the northern part of Lebanon, the western part of Syria, and a land that is still today called Tel Arke, up there north of Sidon. 
The Sinites have nothing to do with Sinai. It's a different root. It looks very similar, but it is not. They were not in the land of Sinai, but they were up near the Archites in Lebanon and Syria. The Arvadites had their capital on a little island off the coast called Arwad, near Tripoli, between Tardis and Tripoli, and they probably controlled much of that region in the northern coast between Heth and Sidon. The Zemurites were up there in that area north of the Archites and the Sinites, east of the Hittites. And the Hamathites were also up in that region in a city called Hamath. And so these were the tribes of the Canaanites. Notice they didn't go very far, at least not at first. Where everyone else is spreading out across the globe, these Canaanites localized themselves, started in intermingling and dwelling again, and their sins were doubling up on their sins, and they became a people so terrible that the land itself spit them out. Those who were spread out across the globe fared much better. But eventually we do get sort of a second Babel with these. Their languages won't be confused, but there will be a diaspora from Canaan. In the time of the exodus of the Israelites, when they come up into the promised land, many of these will be conquered or subdued, having their whole cities killed. Others will not be conquered or subdued at all because of Israel's disobedience. But many of these groups of people decide to hightail it out of there. Even the king of Moab, seeing the Israelites coming over the valley, is scared and tries to curse them because he sees they are a formidable force. A lot of these people groups who see their brothers and sisters getting massacred by the Israelites decide to leave. And so we do get a later migration coming out of Canaan. Primarily, we see this from the Hittites and the Sinites. We see them traceable into the land of China. We already talked about the Hethites brief, briefly, that they may have been the ancestors of the Cathay. But in Genesis 8, 10, 18, we see that afterward, after this time that Moses was writing, the families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. They were spread out from that land. Now that brings us to an interesting, actually, did I write it? I did. These Sinites, I told you the root is different. It doesn't have to do with Sinai. Sinai may have come from the Sinites, but Sinites didn't come from Sinai. Their name, the root of their name is Sin or Sinim. The Hebrews today still call them Sini, and that is the Hebrew name for Chinese. Sinology is the study of the Chinese. The Sino-Japanese wars are the wars between Japan and China. When I was in Korea, we have to learn two different sets of numbers. One is the Han number system, which is the homeland number system, and the other is the Sino number system, the Chinese number system. Sino comes from this name Sinite when they headed out east into the land of China. Now, when they got there, because it was a later migration, there were already people there. In fact, there were probably Japhethites and Shemites in the land already. So they were the latest arrivals. But we do get some interesting legends from the Miyatsu people, which are in the heart of China. The Miyatsu people of China are divided into 11 tribes, it says, which are said to be descended from Segwang, descendant of Gomer, son of Lo Japu. This is their patriarch. He was the son of Nua. Nua survived the great flood in a large boat. Other sons of Nua were Lo Han and Lo Shen. These uh, 
people were not exposed to anything besides the Noahic Bible. Genesis 1 through 11, because that was their history, they lived it. They didn't have anything after that, but their legends reflect an accurate understanding of history. It continues, another part of the legend gives the names of the sons of Lohan as Kusa and Mese, the names of the sons of Loshen as Elan and Nasher. Those were the two lands that they would have passed through to get to China, Elam and Assyria. Elam is Persia. Of the 11 Miyatsu tribes, six intermarried with Hamites and Shemites, tribes who settled in the area forming the Chinese people. The Chinese people are neither Hamites, Shemites, or Japhethites. They're all three. And they carry a very unique understanding of history in their character system. This is the Chinese character for boat. On the left, you see the radical for vessel. And on the top right, you see the character that means eight. And below that, you see the, peop the character that means mouths. A vessel with eight mouths is a boat. Eight people who got on the ark, whose food was provided for them, for the whole year they were there. Vessel, eight people. The Chinese word for boat. This is an interesting one. The word for tongue, which is an idiom for language. You can use that radical to speak of languages. Plus the radical for mystery equals the word confusion. The mystery of the tongues is confusion. Babel is the Hebrew word for confusion. How about to complete or to finish something? Starts with the radical for two. Attached to the radical for person makes the character first. Two people was the first thing. And then the character for first plus the radical home means complete, two people in their first home. And it was finished, and God saw that it was good. And a garden. The radicals for dust, breath, two people in an enclosure. This is a garden. And forbidden, or to warn, if it's used as a verb. It's the radical two trees, and God. Similarly, to covet is two trees plus the woman. And the noun for tempter, a very complex character built off of quite a few radicals that tells a story in and of itself. Secret plus man plus garden plus the radical for life. This makes the character devil. And the devil plus two trees plus the radical for secrecy is the tempter. See, God has a plan for all of his nations. God didn't finish creating in seven days. Once in a while, he steps in and create, creates something new. And at the Tower of Babel, he created 70 new things. 70 new tribes with 70 new languages. See, language is something that distinguishes us from all of God's other creatures. We are made in his image, and we speak not because this is a creature thing, but because this is a creator thing. He gave that to us. Language is something he creates. Language is a gift from God. And it should reflect him, as the Chinese language does. In verse 19, then, we get the land measurements. These were probably the land measurements at the time of Abraham that Moses is now recording. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon in that northern part of the land of Phoenicia 
down towards Gerar, which is on the Sinai Peninsula, but it only went as far as Gaza, which is the northern part of Sinai. As you go down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which is on the east side of the Dead Sea, going as far as Lasha, which the exact location of Lasha is not known, but we know because of the, the uh, paralleled cities that it is somewhere there on the east side of the Dead Sea. So the Canaanites lived in this small little triangle of land. This was where God brought Abraham and told him, I will give you this land. The land of the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now, when the nations were sent out of Babel, God gave 70 different languages, 70 different families, sent them abroad. He had the whole world in mind, but he also had Israel in mind. We see this from Deuteronomy 32, that God was already seeing his future plans for Israel when he did what he did at Babel. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, Moses writes, when he separated the sons of men back in Babel, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. Just like the Levites were separated from the 12 brothers and became God's portion among the Jews, so among the nations of the world, the nation of Israel acts as the Levites. They are people called out for God's purpose. And they were called out, 70 of them, into the land of Egypt. Genesis 46, 26 tells us all the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. We just looked at 29 of those different tribes that uh, Babel had produced. 29, and there were, oh no, math, 39 more. <laughs> God spoke to Israel in a vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Jacob said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. God had national purposes for Israel in sending the 70 down into Egypt to become a strong nation. I will go down with you to Egypt, God said, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Verse 20 is another inclusio. We see this at the end of each one of Noah's son's lines. The end of Japheth, it had the same line, but here at the end of Ham's line, it says these are the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands and by their nations. Each one of these language groups, these 11 language groups from the sons of Ham, or from the sons of Canaan rather, went into the land of Canaan and then eventually spread abroad. We see three generations here. 29 language families in all for Ham, 32 different governments mentioned because we get a little bit of information on Nimrod's government and a bit of information on the Philistine government. That's over a third of the 70 language groups from Babel. A lot of these perhaps died out in wars, perhaps the Ethiopic wars took care of a few language groups. The Canaanites went into other lands that already had established languages. Some may have mixed or blended and created new languages, new hybrid languages, or may have died out. But there's also something quite interesting then with these categories, 
families, languages, lands, and nations as they're sent out because we see that this has to do with God's greater purpose for his whole creation. To have one man ruling over creation on his behalf. Man as man failed to do this. Adam in the garden did not rule on God's behalf, was not subject to God, but subjected himself to the creation. Satan in the form of a serpent. God needs a man who will subject himself to God's will, to God's authority, and he sent his own son to do that. Fitting of a king, the king of the universe, to send his own son to rule for him. And so in Revelation 5, 4 through 5, we see the climax of world history. And we see that no man was found anywhere able to take the title deed of this earth, to rule as God had intended a man to rule. So John began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah and the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. God's peculiar nation has a purpose in his greater purpose for the earth. The king of God's choosing must come through Israel. He has come through Israel. And just as he will unite the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel, so he and he alone can unite these 70 different groups that were spread out from Babel. Until he reigns, they should remain distinct. Nations should not come together under any man besides Jesus Christ, the God-man. Because he and he alone is worthy to rule, because he and he alone does the will of God perfectly. Revelation 5.9 says they, the elders, the 24 elders there, which is the church, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth forever. God's purpose is already set in motion. His king has already come. He has already paid the price to rule. The only thing that needs to fall into line at this point is Israel. Israel must receive their king. And at the moment she does, he will establish his kingdom and begin to rule. But this is what we look forward to. We get to see this happen in heaven. This hasn't happened yet. John is looking into a future time when Jesus Christ will begin to rule as king. And so we look forward to that with anticipation, knowing that the price has already been paid. The nations will come together under the king of God's choosing, Jesus Christ. And so our takeaway, God never loses track of his whole purpose. Even while he focuses his attention on developing one nation, Israel, which will become pretty much the focus of the rest of the Old Testament after Genesis chapter 11. Even while he focuses his attention on developing one nation, he has all peoples, tongues, lands, and nations in mind. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful that your Son, Jesus Christ, has paid the price so that all people of all nations can come directly to you as their King. We pray for the peace of Israel, the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that they would receive their king, not just in individually. We pray that, of course, but nationally. We pray that they would recognize that Jesus Christ was sent as the king of your choosing and that they would receive him as their king, and so he would begin to rule over the entire world. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.